So Lord, we lift our voices together to you. Just thankful for who you are. Knowing that you've saved us. That we're not always worthy of your love. Yet you choose to love us anyways. Lord, we gather here as your people celebrating you. And we just invite you in right now. We ask that your Holy Spirit would fall on this place. That you would just make us open to what it is you want us to receive today. God, we say that you're awesome and uh, just a joy to be here with our friends and with our community. We love you and it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Something seems different up here this morning. Um, I was noticing as I was singing, something just seems different, like older than it was before, just last week. It's Lucas. He's a year older now. <laughs> Happy birthday. Uh, Lucas, you turned 24? 24. I remember 24. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. <laughs> but happy birthday. Lucas turned uh, 24 on Thursday, September 11th. He likes to, to say that, you know, his fiance, Emily Ann, she has the most celebrated day, birthday, because it's July 4th. And for him, his birthday also marks another, another experience in our, our country that was very uh, memorable as well with September 11th. And so the two extremes right there, but you'll never forget their birthdays. Um, and I know that many of you all spent Thursday celebrating and remembering um, the lives that were lost and the bravery of people who stepped in in that time of destruction in our country. This past Friday, I had the opportunity to spend the day with my sister and my niece. We had a great time. Uh, we went to Pigeon Forge for the day, and we went to Wonderworks. Has anybody been there? You've seen it. It's the upside-down house that's on the side of the, of the way going in. It's on the right, just past the Tanger Outlets. Um, so we went in, and it was the most fun that I've had, probably the best money I've spent on something in a long time because you have freedom to do all these crazy things. You can They have a dance place. You can dance, and your image is projected up, and it's, they do all these crazy things with it. Um, you know, you can play with bubbles, bake bubbles this big. Uh, another thing that you can do is you can choose to do their ropes course, and they harness you in. And my niece is just tall enough, 48 inches, just tall enough to do some of those things. And so we decided that even though she's six, we would do this ropes course. And my sister and her and I all harnessed up, and my sister was in the front of the line, and she went up, and we went up the stairs, and... My sister just boldly stepped out on these two, all it was was two ropes that crossed in the middle, and there was nothing to hold on to. There, you know, it was like 20 feet up from the ground, and she just went right across. And I thought, I'm, one of my biggest fears is heights. And so I was like, I don't think I can do this. And here's Eliza in front of me, and she's going to want me to do this, and I can't. And she turned around and she said, I can't go. I don't want to do it. And she started crying. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to just sit out with her and comfort her. But the whole time I was thinking, thank you, Lord, that I didn't have to go across that. But today is another story of people stepping boldly, moving forward. And my sister, once she got across and she looked back, she realized she couldn't come back the way that she came. Um, that, that she had to move forward because she had no idea. She said, it just must have been, I was trying to set an example for Eliza, and I got all the way across, and I wanted to turn back, but I couldn't. And so she went on, and she did all these wonderful challenges, and she had a great time. It was a lot of fun for her. And Eliza and I looked on from the, from the ground and laughed and talked, and we thank, thank God that we did, weren't up there with her in that moment. Um, and so this morning we hear another story about how people step boldly into what... Uh, what's before them, um, and they do look back and wish that they could return to where they came from, uh, but they don't. And so this is the second week in a sermon series, four parts, called Providence, God Makes a Way. Last week we talked about how God sets us apart. We t heard about the people of Israel who during that last plague, the plague of death, they put the blood of the lamb above their doorpost and the spirit of death passed over them, and they were set apart as God's chosen people. 
And we related that back to how we, we as Christians, are set apart through the blood of Jesus Christ, that we are God's chosen people uh, grafted into this family of faith of Israel. And so this week, we're going to talk about how God saves his chosen people. Our passage this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verses 19 through 31. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel, and so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord and the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we know that you are the one who sets us apart and saves us. God, that your protective care, that your providence um, draws us in and that you invite us into a relationship with you. And God, I pray that this morning that you would speak through me and in spite of me into all of our hearts the word that you have for us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So once again, like last week, we're kind of mid-scene. These stories in the Old Testament tend to be very, very long, and so we give you a little snapshot of it in the lectionary text for today. Before this has happened, we know from last week that after the, the spirit of death comes over the Egyptians, that Pharaoh's heart is softened, and he says, get them out of here. Um, I'm going to follow what God wants us to do, and I'm going to set these people free. He finally decides to obey God's servant Moses and to move these Israelites out of Egypt. And so he lets them go. But just about as soon as they've packed up their bags and they're heading out, he realizes he's lost his entire workforce. He's lost all these people who he's built his empire on the backs of, and he has no idea what's going to happen next. And so he panics a little, and he decides that, no, I don't, I don't want that to happen. I'm going to go bring them back. And so he sends out all of his chariots and chariot drivers and his entire army out to pursue the Israelites to bring them back into slavery. I'm assuming that the Israelites um, from a distance could look back and see that things had changed for them. They thought they were on their way to freedom, and they look back and they realize they're being pursued. And so they're panicked. They move forward, they look forward, and what do they see? A sea in front of them, a, a place that is too far to pass over. It's too deep to wade through. They are trapped. What has been behind them is terrible, but what lies before them is the unknown. They have no idea if they're going to be able to pass through these waters. And so they start to panic, and they talk to Moses, God's chosen servant, and they say, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you would have to bring us out here into the wilderness to die? We, we know that there's no hope for us. Can't we just go back to the life that we had before? Sure, it was terrible. It was miserable. We were enslaved, but it was, at least we were alive. At least we were safe. At least it was something that we knew. Um, the unknown was crippling for them. 
They wanted the familiar. They wanted the safety of what they had known, as miserable as it was. In spite of their complaining, you know, God, they cried out and said all these things to Moses. In spite of that, um, God decides to save them, to make a way where there seems to be no way. So God worked through his servant Moses, calling him and telling him to stretch out his hand over the sea. And as he stretched it out, the winds began to move and the sea was parted. And all night long, the winds moved. And as the day broke, the sea was parted and they could see. And God had put a protective cloud behind them so that the Israelites would not be attacked in the night by the Egyptians. And God called them to step forward. Now, we read that the Israelites walked through on dry ground. We know that there was a wall to their left and a wall to their right, but we don't really get the full story. Um, We have to kind of read between the lines about what happened. And as I was preparing for this sermon, I started thinking about what would have been like to actually be there, to be the people of Israel, to think that there was no way to be saved, to know that I was going back to slavery in Egypt and that the one who set me apart really hadn't set me apart and saved me, that that was just my destiny to go back. And all of a sudden, I realized there is a way for me to move forward. But it's hard to take that first step. And so bear with me, because I was thinking, okay, at first daybreak, whenever you start to see the magnitude of what God has done, I can imagine some little children who are fearless. Children were fearless then, just like they are now. And they see this massive parting of the seas, and they run towards it. They want to see what God has done. And as they approach, they can see that, wow, the land is dry, but maybe there's still some remnants of the seafloor there. There's some seagrass or some rocks that are there, but the ground is dry. And they can look at the water and they can see all the living things that are inside the water. And so one of them, and this is how I imagine it happened, one of them steps out onto that dry ground. And I imagine somebody reaching in and pulling them back a parent or a grandparent who says, we don't know what's on the other side of that. What if we all get in there and our entire community is, is trapped? What if, the flood, what if the waters come over us? We don't know what's ahead of us. Don't go out there just yet. Let's, let's look at this further. I would have been afraid if it was my child, knowing that that was the only path to freedom was between two walls of water that could easily, easily drown drown me. So I imagine that as the people decided, well, the only thing alternative to us looking back is to be in slavery. We're going to take our chances and walk through these two walls of water. And it was a large enough passing that the entire community of Israel and the entire Pharaoh's army would have been in the midst of that crossing. And so it probably took them a little while. And I assume that they probably cautiously but swiftly were moving forward through this path that God had created for them, through this way that God had made for them when there seemed to be no way. And I imagine that, you know, the kids were probably holding hands with one another so that nobody got lost. Maybe there was an older member of the community that was being helped along by some of the younger ones. And I don't know why, but in my head, I imagine that there is one kid that has his nose pressed up against the wall of the water looking at all the things that are floating around and swimming around in the sea. It's kind of like being in an aquarium is what I was thinking of it as. But instead of having the multiple feet of glass between you and the water protecting you, there is only the hand of God holding back that water. And so these people of Israel, these chosen people, they walk through these waters and they get to the other side. And not even their cloaks, not even their feet are wet. Like this floor that was saturated, that was covered by feet of water has been dry and their, their feet are probably dusty because it's so dry. And they look back and they see what God has done, that God has helped them to pass through, that God has made a way and has saved them from the Egyptians. And then the Egyptians follow suit and they get there and they're in the middle of it and all of a sudden they're trapped. They can't move. Their feet begin to seek into the sand or the floor of this sea They can't move and they want to go because they know that this God, this God of the Israelites is so powerful and they realize that now and they're not going to pursue the Israelites anymore, but it's too late. It's too late for them. And so Moses stretches out his hand and the waters fall over them and they drown. And as they do that, the people of Israel, they celebrate, they rejoice because the one who set them apart has also saved them 
from a life of, sa- of slavery. Now that's troubling for us to hear because we, in our current day and time, we're not promoting the killing of people. We, it's hard to read those acts of God that, are, um, that are, are difficult, where God will pour out the water and an entire group of people dies. It's hard to read that they're paralyzed, that they can't move. And that's not just their own doing, but that's, that's God clogging up the wheels of their chariots. It's hard because this act of God we read about, we are about a God of second chances, a God who offers grace upon grace upon grace. I don't want to go into uh, too deeply this morning about God's wrath in the Old Testament, but I will say that the way that I reconcile this story is to remember that God's desire that day wasn't just to save the people of Israel, but God's desire that day was to be glorified. And I don't know that it could have been any other way that God needed to be glorified to save these people, that he would be lifted up as the one who gives life but also has the power to take it away. And through these actions, through this action, God was glorified through the Israelites and was revered by Pharaoh as he saw the power of God at work. God's chosen people were saved and God made his power known to them. And this act, for me, it doesn't justify the killing that happened, the killing of an enemy, but to me, it does call us to glorify God in the midst of suffering and death. So this story ends with the people of Israel on the other bank. They've come through this path that God has made for them. And they're believing and fearing the Lord in a way that they never had before. And not just believing in the Lord, but believing in the servant Moses that God had sent to them. They had followed this leader that God had put in their path. They didn't have to. They could have stayed on the other shore, and yet they decided to move forward. And God set them apart and saved them that day. As I mentioned last week, we too, as people of faith, have been set apart by God. And I think that God seeks to save us from the things that threaten to overcome us. I don't know about you, but there are lots of things in my life that I wish I could get away from. Uh, When I look back at the things that have happened in my life, I want to move forward. I want to go, but I'm afraid, and it doesn't seem that there's a path for me to go forward in. I want God to make a way where there seems to be no way. As miserable or as challenging as life has been for me, at times, at least I knew what to expect. It's hard to step out into the unknowns. We know how to handle things as bad as they are. We know how to control things as they currently exist. But many times we're paralyzed by that unknown, that uncertainty that God has before us. And like the people of Israel, God is calling us to step forward, to move, to move forward into what God has for us. God wants to save us from those things that threaten to overcome us. And I know that could mean many things to many people. Perhaps it's a relationship that has enslaved you. I shared uh, about a month ago about an abusive relationship I was in, and that caused me to have a passion to reach out for women um, and men who were in abusive relationships. And in my time of seminary, I actually uh, began to stay at a safe house overnight, kind of as the chaperone. I would set the alarm every night so that the women and the children felt safe, And I would go to bed, and I would be there in case the alarm sounded in the middle of the night or someone needed something. And as I got to know these women and I got to know their stories, I realized that they were just like everybody else. They had gotten into a situation, and they didn't know how to get out of it. They were so familiar with being degraded and emotionally, physically, and sometimes even financially abused, that they were controlled. This was their only, the only thing they knew. And the uncertainty, the not knowing was so strong that a lot of times they stayed in those situations. But then this this safe house, this community that surrounded them with support, that was the way that God was going to lead them out of this situation. God had made a way where there seemed to be no way, a place of safety where they could come and get their life back in order. There were many of those women who went on, who took advantage of the many offerings that that system had, helping them find jobs, helping them find places to live, helping their children be enrolled in a school that was safe for them. There were lots of women who went back who couldn't quite move forward into what God had for them. They were so captured and enslaved to this feeling that they couldn't move forward. 
They couldn't take that next step that God had called them to take. They needed support. They needed a community. And the same way that the Israelites passed through that water and they didn't leave anybody behind, they needed somebody to surround them to find community. And my hope is that if they didn't find it then, that they found it later, that they were encouraged uh, by other people and that they began to see that God could make a way in their life where there seemed to be no way, that God could save them from that situation if they just took that step forward to reach out for help. Their fear of change was often greater than their chance for new life ahead of them. You know, maybe um, another thing that is threatening to overcome you is an addiction of some sort. Um, I struggle a lot with food. I've always had food issues. From the time I could earliest remember, food has been my way to celebrate. It has been the thing that comforts me whenever I want to rejoice, but it's also been the thing that comforts me when I need, when I'm depressed or sad. Um, it's the thing that I reach for automatically to fill this void inside of me, to quiet the voice inside of me. Um, so I celebrate with food. I am sad with food. I eat when I'm bored. So even when I'm not feeling many emotions at all, that's the first thing that I go to. And in many ways, for many, many years, that was something that, was a bond, that bound me, something that I was enslaved to, was seeking to fill something inside of me with the food that was before me. I'll never forget the day that I decided that this grip of food on me was going to go away, that I was going to move forward into what God had for me. And so um, it was very scary. Uh, all I wanted to do was go back home because in, when I'm afraid, I eat too. And so all I wanted to do was go back home and to fix some kind of comfort food and to tell myself it was okay because my grandma used to fix it for me every single time I visited her. Um, I love to cook, and that's what I, I did with my time. And so I was afraid of, you know, what happens if I go and get help for this and I can't cook anymore because all I know how to cook is the delicious southern food that I grew up on, and it's not always, always so healthy uh, for you. It's something that I'm good at. What if I, I get there and I can't, I can't make it work? What if it doesn't work for me? But I find, and I kept saying, I'll start getting healthy tomorrow. Does anybody else have that? Tomorrow. Or I'll just eat this one thing, and, you know, later I'll, I'll say no to it. Um, I need to splurge because I've had a good day. Um, but through the help and support of a group, for me, that focused on health and wellness, I was able to make good decisions and to progress in dealing with my food issues um, I realized that I was feeding something inside of me that could not be satisfied with food, um, that I was using food to overcome feelings that I needed to wrestle with my, on myself. Since then, uh, in the past year and a half, I lost 30 pounds. That's a pretty, pretty big deal. That's like my niece when she was three. Um, and, you know, since I've been married... I've gained a few back because that's what happens when you get married and you start cooking for your spouse and you want to impress them with all the things that you know how to make. And so you go back to the old book of comfort food because you know that he loves cheese. And so you've got to do everything with cheese smothered on it. And so I, I'm still wrestling with the food. It's a day-by-day -day thing, but I know, I know that God has made a way for me where there seemed to be no way. And that through God... God's help by surrounding me with community, this group that I'm a part of, um, that I've been able to find the support that I need to pass through those waters that threaten to overcome me. I'm not in the promised land yet, and neither were the Israelites when they got to the other side of the shore, but I'm walking boldly through the path that God has led me to. Now, these are just two examples of things that threaten to overcome us, and there are many, many more in our lives. I don't know where you are right now, but I think about sometimes money threatens to overcome me, that I am so gripped by the money in my life that it's difficult sometimes to function. I either have too much debt, not enough money, not enough things. I can't have things good enough. I don't have enough money to buy all the things that will make me look like I have it all together. I think about success and how sometimes success and wanting success grips our life in a way that is very powerful that we're willing to do or say or be anything to be successful. And brothers and sisters, I see it a lot in our kids, our students, that we put so much pressure on them to be successful that they're willing to do or be or say anything 
to be successful. And to me, that is something that threatens our community. Maybe it's addiction to something. For me, it was food. I wrestled with food. But for others, it might be an addiction to some kind of substance or pornography or alcohol. It could be you're addicted to a person or relationship. I saw a sign this past week on a church billboard that said, I'm addicted to Jesus. And I thought, well, that in theory may sound great, but I don't know that any kind of addiction should be celebrated like that. Addiction is something that we should be freed from. Maybe I'm freed from addiction and God has saved me from that. Might be a little better way to save that, that God has redirected my addiction to a focus on God. Well, whatever may be enslaving you right now, I want you to know that God is there to make a way where there seems to be no way for you. That God will miraculously part the waters in your life that God may send a leader into your midst that leads you on that journey the same way that Moses led the people of Israel, that person that God speaks through to you. You know those people that speak truth into your life, and you're called to step forward, to step out, to follow the path that God has before you. As the band comes forward, um, I want you to think about those people, those Moseses in your life. Are there people around you that are speaking God's truth into your life, that are calling you out to, to be delivered from what you've been enslaved to? And just like the people of Israel, you have a choice of whether or not you decide to step into what God has for you or not. And I wonder, are you going to boldly step forward like that little kid who ran up to the edge and just put his foot right in? Are you going to be the person who just rips them back, you know, I want to stay in the safety of what I know, because the familiar, as horrible as it is, at least I know what's going to happen. I think God is calling us to take step forward, steps forward in our lives. God's calling us um, into relationship with him, and God wants to save us, wants to free us from the things that enslave us. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning in different places in our lives. God, we've experienced um, those things that redirect our focus from you. God, we've in many ways been enslaved to things in our life, from food to relationships to money, success. And we turn those over to you, God, because we know that you are the one who saves us. You have set us apart as your people and your providence, your protective care. You desire to surround us with support and love. God, I pray that you would send people into our lives who are like Moses, who speak truth to us, who call us out of our comfort zone and into what you have for us, God. And I pray that there are those moments when you would speak through us as you spoke through Moses, that you would let us be the ones who speak truth into the lives of those around us, that that truth would be a message of hope, of salvation, a message that reminds us that we are the beloved children of God. God, I pray that as we continue to worship you, that we would turn everything over to you, those things that bind us, that we would release those to you knowing that you will save us, that you will deliver us, that you will make a way where there seems to be no way. It's in Jesus' name we pray.